and Robert L. Reed is going to be our moderator for the panel. Um, Rob is an inventor, a maker, an Agile evangelist, and a former Presidential Innovation Fellow who has led Agile workshops for the GSA, the SSA, and other agencies. He co-founded 18F and 18F Consulting. Rob speaks Esperanto flu fluently. And we have um, a few people that you've already seen on the panel and one that you haven't. So let me introduce the one that you haven't met yet, and that is Mark Vogel Jisang. Uh, Mark is an enthusiastic Agile practitioner working in the federal government, committed to clearing hurdles for code deployments and speeding up the time to delivery. He works with government product owners and development teams to identify high priority tasks and releases them incrementally. And I'll hand it over to Rob to start the panel. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, thanks, everybody. This has been a whirlwind uh, situation. We had a lot of great talks in 15 minutes there. Now we have 20 minutes for the panelists. We can relax a little bit, but try to get everything in. Based on those excellent talks, I'm going to change some of my prepared questions. Um, I would like to thank Mark and also Joshua Smith who will be uh, here later. They were backup speakers, so they were not speaking uh, today, but they had talks prepared in case someone dropped out. So I'd like to honor Mark by giving him the first question. Um, Mark, you work at the GSA, but you are not at 18F. We've been talking a lot about 18F today. Um, and we've seen a lot of people talk about cultural change. Anne and, and Greg in particular uh, have had executive positions doing that. Uh, you're closer to program manager level. Uh, can you talk about how you see the state of Agile within the federal government today? Sure. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I think it, there's been kind of a couple of areas where there's been a great response. Uh, the vendor community has certainly responded. Uh, you regularly see vendors promoting their Agile expertise, uh, both in proposals and in marketing materials. Um, at the same time, you're seeing a lot of divisions and branches in the federal space. They know that they need to include Agile in their contracts and in their business cases when they're requesting funding. Um, however, I think there's a lot of inexperience still at the branch and division level uh, where you need a lot of coaching and mentorship to bring these folks along. Uh, folks at the product owner level, they need some of that time and space to learn how to be an appropriate product owner. Um, a lot of the times that role for them is kind of an afterthought. And it's, well, I've got my regular job and then I've also got this software project that I need to knock out. Um, with the extra hours in my day. Um, that, that's just really hard to do with Agile since it's such a high touch. So I think you know, getting mentorship in at the, at the branch and at the uh, program level is certainly really important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now I, I'd, um, I'm, we didn't have a Q&A session room to go voted to Greg because of the way timing worked out. So um, I'm fascinated by one thing. Um, Greg is the opposite of this. Uh, but sometimes there are executives in government who are intransigent and slow to change and so forth. And I know Greg has personally dealt with a lot of those people, sometimes at extremely high levels. Um, so, Greg, my question to you is, how as a uh, low-level executive or a program manager, someone like, like Mark, for example, how do you influence the executive who is reluctant to fully support Agile? Um, yeah, so I, Anne sort of referred to this in her slide deck, but I'll give a detailed example. So um, you, you have to create the burning platform for that executive and, and honestly and truthfully explain to them the very predictable future that them not getting on board is going to directly cause the failure. And, um, and so it's a bit of a fear tactic, but there's also a positive message at the end of it is that they can be an innovative leader and a, and a, and a leader in this organization making government work. And, um, you know, so you have this other element of like join on board. Um, the other thing that I would do that I did in almost every scenario was a little bit of element around this is going to happen right, that the train has already left the station, we're moving, um, time to get on board. Because um, what I found in government is people were really willing to stop stuff. Uh, but 
they were most terrified to be left behind. And if the impression, and it's why you have to constantly keep up intensity and speed because it's not necessarily because you have to be intense and speed. It's the impression that this is happening and they all want to get on board as opposed to raising their veto vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's interesting. And, and Greg probably has a lot of very interesting stories. I don't know if he's willing to relate them in, in this forum. We do have the virtual networking room. Uh, and so hopefully not during this panel, but after this panel, uh, maybe people, if they want to meet somebody, they can talk there and, and utilize this. What we're trying to do with this conference is not make it like a webinar, but make it where people can make human connections the way they could if they were at a physical conference. So I'd, I'd like to thank all our speakers again. And also, um, we seem to have about 150 participants. So thank you very much for everybody who's listening. Um, my next question is for Anne, and it's kind of the opposite of the question for Greg, even though their roles were somewhat similar. Um, in the Slack channel, uh, you guys may not have seen, um, people were intrigued by your talk, Anne, about failure. And they particular, but the, the particular question was, how do you create a soft landing for people, let's say not executives, but program managers who are in charge of a project or a, a large project? product so to speak how do you how do you create a possibility for them to fail that's sort of acceptable yeah so it takes two things right number one is the employee who is taking the risk has to be very clear about what they're doing and i talked a little about this in my q a um you know if if it's a pretty new thing for your organization the employee may actually want to write it down. Talk to their boss, hey, I'm gonna take this risk, what do you think, are you okay with it? They negotiate that, and then they may even wanna follow up and send an email, hey, this is what we agreed to, I'm gonna take this risk. So they can feel like they've got that safety. I think as organizations evolve and mature, you don't need to take that step, but you do need to talk to your boss. I'm taking this risk consciously, I know it's a risk. I know this organization is risk averse, so this is what I'm gonna do. The obligation on the other side of the management team is that once they've agreed with that employee, that that risk is okay, that everybody supports that, right? So if they do fall, if that project falls flat and the money is lost, the management team says, yep, we told that employee they could do that. There's no consequences for that. In fact, thank you very much for trying. And, you know, all the way up to the top of the leadership uh, needs to be accountable and responsible for that. So if I have an employee three layers down in my organization who we all agree can take a risk and it fails and, you know, the CEO of the county government calls me into his office, I'm going to say, yep, that was my decision. I decided it was okay for that employee to fail. So the whole organizational culture really has to support that, right? And so, you know, we, we talk about how hard uh, change can be and how hard agile is. And, and one of the challenges is middle management, right? Because the senior executives are going, rah, 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 go do this. The employees are saying, wow, that's great. And the middle managers are going, well, I don't know, right? And so we have to make sure that that, that goes all the way up the chain. Okay, that, that's really an excellent question. I, I'm, I'm going to steal that and use it in the future. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so, Tim, I have a question for you, and um, it, it, I'm very pleased. Uh, actually, Ann now works for a county as well, but a lot of this has been from people who either were in federal government or are in federal government, like, like Mark, um, and you're operating at a county level. The federal government has a weird relationship with contractors. Sometimes the contractors are part of the team, but sometimes they're very much standoffish, like we're giving you orders, come back in a year with everything done, uh, you know, and, and we're just gonna deal with you almost in a legalistic way, which makes it very hard from an agile point of view. Um, your team at the county, it sounds like you've built a, a nice team culture around agile. And I just wonder, are you doing that with contractors or are all of those people your employees? In our case, it's, they're our employees. Uh, this see. is our team. And now we do have, uh, in fact, we've done this. We're doing this right now. Uh, we'll bring in contractors, actually like hired hands, devs, and they'll participate in the, uh, the scrum with us. And to me, that's the best way to identify, like if you ever want to know what the contractor's working on, well, every day they're telling you. And every day we have a stand up and we talk about it. So, so in our case, since we're, I mean, we're a county, we have eight people, uh, you know, and one of the, uh, the mantras of agile is to 
self-organized. Well, we really didn't have that opportunity because we just were the team. Y'all are the team to, you know, there, there was no option to bring in anyone else. But when we do uh, introduce, you know, I guess, let me see if I can say it this way. When we have openings, when we have positions that are there, we already have, Agile is already in place. It's part, it is what we do. It's part of our being. So we just train folks on how to, uh, to become, right, to, 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 be, to be part of the team. And we've done the same thing with contractors, too. We brought them in, and then they have to adhere to our rules of Agile. Okay, thank you. So we have a question from the audience, and I'm, I'm gonna, I've got questions for everybody. But um, I guess I would like to direct this to Anne. Um, not knowing exactly who of our panelists is the best person to answer this. Michael Coffey sends in a question. Thank you very much, Michael. When creating software, often there may be a change in management or training component to inform or teach employees how to do their job differently. What advice would you give to learning professionals who are embedded in agile teams and responsible for providing training, et cetera, throughout the life cycle of a project? And so, Anne, that question is for you. I'm not sure I understand it perfectly the way it's written. Can you just do the best you can with that? I think they're talking about change management in the, in the case of personnel changes on an Agile team. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll talk about it, and then Greg might want to jump in a little bit on this too. Um, but I think, you know, the, the key is uh, here is that it's not really a learning and development job to train people in Agile. The, way, um, the approach I wouldn't take is necessarily to, which is, I think the question was being asked was, let's put some trainers in and have them teach them how to do Agile. Um, I would encourage you to embed knowledgeable, experienced developers, uh, UI designers, scrum masters, whatever, in the team and have and the training to essentially be an on-the-job experience, right? So I'm working in this team. I'm learning by by working with people who are very experienced, and that's really how I would would do that. Um, certainly, you can send people off for some training exercises and things like that. But this is something that, if you're an experienced developer, the best thing you can do is learn it by working with other people who know it. And the reason I say I like Greg to jump in is because he was doing this at EPA and other places, so he may have more to say on it. Yeah, thanks, Ann. I, you know, it's, um, I, I'm not a big believer in training in sort of the classic sense that, that people talk about. It's really what's needed is, is coaching. You need to be doing and applying it if you're going to learn it and build those ha habits. So what we would work on is building a service. And so at EPA, we also did this um, at 18F, but at EPA, we had a, um, a team, a pilot team, we would call them, and they, they'd be a user-centered design expert and an agile developer who would go in and plan to work for about eight weeks with any team in the organization and help them build the product. That was the sell, right? Like they're not training you, don't worry, right? They're here to help you build the product. And what ended up happening is you know, it was so successful each time. The first time we did it, the, the manager telling me says, well, we're already doing agile. And I said, well, that's great. Well, then this will be easy. You know, they'll fit right in. And literally six weeks in, I get this celebratory panicked kind of call and he's like, I thought I knew what Agile was, right? Now, imagine how hard that would have been to tell him he didn't know what Agile was, right? But instead, here's a team that's going to help you build it faster and better. And it just so happened at six weeks is when the velocity of the team skyrocketed, right? And it right. was the whole team got it. So it's really about coaching. Okay, thank you. Boy, time is really uh, running out for us here. So let me um, direct a question to Doug. Um, Doug, you and I have something in common. We both love to run workshops uh, yeah. for people. So my, my question to you is, can you describe what happens when you run a workshop for a team that's totally cold, that is, is really just doing Agile for the first time? They may have read about it, but they've never run an Agile project. Well, the, when, you, when you start a brand new team on a brand new workshop, the first thing you, you have to do is sort of divorce the nervousness of learning a new thing um, from the workshop. So like Tim said, um, when he described the way he integrates a contractor into the team, and like Greg talked about, um, you know, bringing those, uh, those cultural um, immigrants into a team to help them learn without training them, the first thing you want to do in a workshop while giving some information is to start to establish a sense of community with the people who are in their workshop. It's especially powerful if this, if you're training a team that will become 
a team together, but it also works to establish the rules of how you enter this community, um, which means you're doing some of this, you're doing this agile stuff, so here's the information, but give them the time and the workshop to practice those roles, practice those behaviors, and start to feel comfortable with the language, just like if you're taking a French class, start to feel comfortable saying we oui instead of yes, um, and let them laugh at each other and let them joke. That's the way to, to get a workshop off to a really great start. Merci, monsieur. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, so um, your talk was very interesting. I, I kind of get the feeling though, you, you've done some things which not everyone in the audience may understand because it's fairly new. Um, when you were at 18F, um, with Greg's support, you pioneered procurement challenges. And um, if people haven't participated in these things, I'm not sure they know exactly what it is. So could you please describe what a procurement challenge is and what, how it is changing the way procurement is done in the federal government? Yeah, well, in this in particular case, and it's not, uh, it's not necessarily suitable in all situations, but in this particular one, because government contracting can be onerous, uh, government typically likes to set up kind of broad contract vehicles where prices and terms and conditions are pre-negotiated and then just task orders and work orders can be issued directly off of that. So in this particular case, setting up such a contract vehicle uh, the approach that we pioneered was, and it's not like doing prototypes or, you know, Army does this all the time, right? You know, well, you know, prototypes of like jet fighters and things like that. But I think in terms of within the context of IT, it was unique in that we asked vendors to produce a prototype based on, if you go, I think it's openfda.gov. Uh, so we basically gave them um, an API service and a data set and said, okay, based on this, you know, based on this problem domain, come up with some prototypes that leverages this API, um, executing particular, you know, agile and technical practices. And then we're going to have a team of technical experts who are probably just as smarter, smarter than you, uh, evaluate the quality of that prototype and make awards based on that. So it was really, is really, you know, an approach to evaluating demonstrated capability over reading like really like lengthy embellished proposal narratives, which is kind of typically done. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, it was really unique from that standpoint, led to amazing results. Right, right. Yeah, so it, I mean, it's really a sea change in the way procurement is done. Obviously, it, as you said, it only applies to some procurements. It's much more like an audition or a tryout, like a baseball tryout, as opposed to someone sending in their resume about their baseball skills right? In the sense that you force teams, sometimes for one day, sometimes for one week, to actually act in an agile way on writing something that they've never seen before. Um, so it's, it's really uh, a trial by fire. And it's, it's quite, quite different than the old ways of doing procurement, which tend to favor the Beltway bandits and favor people who have experience and competency in applying for those kinds of things. So we're almost out of time, but I, I have an interesting um, question here that perhaps I'll direct to Mark uh, because he's in the federal government. Um, uh, someone asked, how, does, uh, how would you characterize the impact on you when you elect a new president when you're in the, the federal government? <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it, when a new administration comes in, it's a challenge to understand what their priorities are. Um, being at GSA, we are uh, a group that is largely self-funded, um, so we don't experience the same pressures that maybe Anne and Greg had experienced when they were at EPA. Um, that said, you know, we still experience some of those. Um, so it's, it's getting a feel for it, and you know, this administration um, might have taken a little bit longer, but it's uh, difficult to say I've only been through it on the federal side once, so. Um. Okay, thank you. And, and that's all of our time. I'd like to thank all of our panelists and speakers, and also thanks to all our 150 participants. We really hope you're enjoying the conference. This is uh, new for us. It's the first time we've done anything like this, and we really want your feedback.